us today. Uh, it'd be brilliant if you could just introduce yourselves, who you are. So to my left. My name is um, Rosemary Mallet. I am a vicar of the St John the Evangelist Church in Angeltown, which is close to Brixton. And I'm also the director of social justice for the Diocese of Southwark, which is an Anglican diocese in South London and East Surrey. My name's Owen Hilton, and I'm the pastor of Beacon Church in Brixton. Uh, and I've been married to Pauline for 28 years, and we have three daughters, the last of whom has just left home and gone to university. Brilliant. Um, the whole idea of what we're doing with Power to Fire is trying to get many different views and many different perspectives on this youth violence issue. And today, what we really want to talk about is kind of the church response. You guys both have churches in Brixton, in South East London, an area which has seen uh, a lot of youth violence over, over the years. So I suppose the first question I just want to put to you guys up is like, what do you feel are the reasons for this increase? I and mean, you've seen families, you've worked with families, you've seen young people. What do you feel is the reasons why we're seeing such an increase in the youth violence, um, not just in London, but in the UK? I think that at the moment there seems to be maybe a spiralling out of the despair amongst some of our young people, and I have to state from the very beginning that it is a minority of our young people who are engaging in this significant and serious youth violence. <coughs> However, the impact is massive because it impacts the communities, it impacts um, their families specifically, it impacts their education and their, their capacity to then be parts, you know, functioning <coughs> parts of the community <coughs> subsequently. And most often they end up in prison uh, or dead. So why now? We've had peaks. This isn't the first peak that we've had. I mean, I've been in Angeltown working as a minister there for 11 years, and we at the moment are going through a bit of a, a trough in terms of the numbers of deaths that we've seen. That doesn't mean that it's not moved elsewhere. It's moved to Tulse Hill. It may have moved to other parts of the country as well. But what's happening is that more young people, younger and younger people, are aspirational in terms of the things that they think they want and they think they need, which is a challenge because parents can't provide it. They're not seeing their ability to earn that through their educational capacity. Many of them are being caught up in the exclusion to Prue pipeline. And so they're out of school, they've got nothing to do, and the educational capacity is not being challenged. So I think that's really part of our problems. And then the drugs have exploded in terms of being able to be involved in county lines mm. and then moving it out of their communities and then nationwide. So more and more young people are being caught up in it. And I think that's <coughs> fueling more and more young people then um, fighting for territory, right. fighting for drugs, mm. mostly fighting each other. Mm. And that's really, really sad. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a range of factors. I don't think there's one thing. I, I think that some of those factors will be economic, just in terms of where people live, uh, poverty. I think some of those factors are social in terms of the breakdown of family. Um, and it's not even necessarily that kids don't have mentors or even that they don't have fathers at home. That's always a big one. People talk about the fatherlessness, but sometimes fathers don't feel they're able to do anything to help. I think that has a part of it. I, I think there's some, some, some political stuff going on. I think, I think in the media, things are being brought out a bit more as well. Um, so I think there are, there are, there are loads of factors. And, and I also think that youth culture itself is, um, um, has distanced itself from mainstream culture. And therefore, it functions in a very, very different way. And part of the functioning of that at the worst end is this kind of thing. Right, okay. Now that's helpful. And I suppose one of the things is that we see, like you said, there is this almost subculture of, of young people getting involved in different bits and pieces. As church leaders, uh, specifically, what type of things have you kind of done to kind of combat some of these things that you've just spoken about? What are you, in your experiences? So a couple of things we've done as church, almost as soon as I moved into Angeltown, and I mean in South London, Angeltown is synonymous with um, youth and gang violence, was to put a knife bin 
outside of the church. And people say, well, would they use it when they did? Mm. They, it challenged our young people. That was the first thing. So the first thing when it went on site, they came on to the church site in front of my house and rode around on their bicycles during the night for about an hour as a way of kind of saying to me, you think that you can do something, but we can show you. They did that. I was a bit scared, I have to say. Yeah. However, subsequent to that, <clears throat> We've had a good relationship, and for as long as it stood there before it had to be moved, it was used by mm. our young people. So that was one thing. But you can just put a bin. For me, that stood for peace, that we stand for peace. We understand you. We know that there are challenges. Some, symbol. Some of, yeah, it's, yeah. A sim it's symbolic, yeah. but it's not at the police station. It's outside of a church. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of peace. So outside of the church is a symbol mm. that we stand for peace. That was one thing we did. The other thing we did is we say, we can't work with everyone, so let's try and build the aspirations of the young people who we do um, have the capacity to work with. So let's see what we can do to encourage them, to engage them, and to help them learn to be leaders so that they can then, I pray, yeah. go out and percolate yeah. amongst <coughs> this subculture of young people. Yeah. You can't get out to everybody, but if you can, you know, affect the life of a young person sure. that may affect the lives of other young people around them. So that's what I feel is where I put my energy. Yeah. So whenever I see at the end of, you know, the end of the school year, young people getting their good results. And then when I see at the beginning of the term, university students, like we've had four go off mm. uh, to university this year, I say, from Angel Town, yeah. we every year, year on year, we're sending young people out to university yes. to start for the next stage of their journey. Okay. That's what I feel is part of the contribution. Yeah. No, that, and, that, and that is amazing. I mean, I mean I've, I've come to your church. Yeah. I've seen, uh, and just to be clear, I've always said that I, I don't think youth violence in the UK is just a black mm. problem. I think it's important to say that. But we also have to acknowledge that it disproportionately impacts Absolutely. black children um, especially in inner city areas such as Brixton and South London. What surprised me more than anything when I've come to your church, I've seen these apparently stereotypical kids, black, predominantly boys, uh, engaging in church life uh, in, in, a, in a way which I think we need to be pro promoting more. How, what's the secret? <laughs> I mean, well, how, how did you manage to, to, to keep these young men predominantly engaged in a way? And, like, you know, you've mentioned some of these kids have gone off to university. You've got kids in your congregation have gone to Eton and things mm. like that. Just talk a little bit around mm. that. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there isn't a secret. And um, certainly uh, it, it would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge we've had some fantastic youth workers who have volunteered time and worked tirelessly over the years. And more recently, uh, a couple in particular um, were just, just really, really good at um, engaging and bringing young people into the church. What I realised, though, is that the church had to be open to that right. and the church had to adjust to that. Yes. And that took a lot of energy and effort. Um, but one of the ways that we've, we've done it is... Um, really um, just done our very best to include and always be willing to include. Sure. So, uh, so when you've been and, and people have been, what you'll see at our church is you'll see those same young guys helping on creche, they help with PA, they help with all the things that make church work, they help with. Yeah. And it's been a way of including them. And um, when our very key uh, and brilliant youth worker left, I remember taking a number of them out for lunch, um, uh, took them to, to Nando's and, uh, and I was just, I said, what are you guys going to do? Because this was your real connection. And I remember one of them said, oh, Beacon's our church. Yeah. Beacon's our church. And so we have just sought to work with them in relation to that. Um, I mean, you know me, Ben, I'm not a youthy kind of leader. I'm not that kind of guy. But what I've discovered is that if you uh, give people attention, if you give them opportunity, if you, if you show them grace, um, then they, they are responsive. And yeah. I am discovering that they are being very responsive to us. But one of the things you've both kind of alluded to is that, I mean, how long have you been 
the, the vicar in Angleton. I've been the vicar there for 11 years. So that's 11 years. 11 and Beacon's years. been... Yeah, I've been there nearly 10 years now. So we're talking about a, like a decade, over a decade of, of time yeah. And, yeah. and energy. And what I'm picking up through other conversations is, is that... And this will feed into what the government talks about as well in terms of the need for a, a long-term... Yes. A holistic public health model where you can't just say we're going to try and sort this out with a, a two, three week program and all this type of thing. I think um, what would be helpful, because I, I can imagine there may be some pastors, uh, some members of churches or even other faith groups watching this or listening to this and thinking, well, okay, that's easy for you guys. You, you know, you, you, you've been there a long time. You've also been the type of people who, are, I mean, you're walking the streets and you're, you know, you're having knife bins and all this type of stuff. What about the people who are, who, who are hearts are breaking for this? What would you suggest or recommend would be some first steps? If you're seeing this type of stuff in your community, you're a church leader, you're a pastor, and you're thinking, well, how do I even engage with this? Either as a leader or a church member, could you give any kind of advice or thoughts of first first points? Of I mean, I I think that um, as a Christian and as a pastor, um, when God puts something on your heart like this, <clears throat> that the first thing you do is you pray, and 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 but you don't pray like, oh, I'll pray for a little bit, well, and then I'll do something. Uh, you have to believe that prayer is a powerful agent that God uses to change things. And so I think deep in my heart, I've been praying around youth and that kind of thing for, for years, really. And to be honest, I, I didn't have a, a way of helping. I didn't, ha I didn't have a way. I, I watched things happen. We, we had a guy who was connected to our church, this is a few years ago now, who was, uh, in fact, he was stabbed six times here in Peckham. He survived. We tried, to, we tried to arrange a, a service of almost a, a, just an opportunity for, for, for the community and him and his family to, to kind of almost be grateful to God. And they found that a really difficult thing to engage with. And so yeah. that didn't happen. But for, for years we've been praying and trying and, and, and trying to work it out. And then it's only in recent years where God mm. has really allowed us to be effective in that work. And so I, I, I think prayer has been a key thing for me. Um, I think then talking to people, uh, talking to you, talking to other people um, has been a key thing for me. And then, although it might seem bizarre, lastly, then engaging with young people, um, but engaging with them in a way where I'm not coming in with solutions. Right. I'm almost trying to allow them to lead yeah. how we go. Yeah. Um, and as I've done that, and worked with the youth that we've got, mm. then, then I think that, that, has, that has grown. So there's a degree of kind of a youth-led, not like completely, yeah. but there's a, you're given the youth uh, responsibility and uh, with a guiding hand. Is that what is the kind of your... That is, I mean, it is partly how I've, how I've parented my, my girls. So where they have shown aspiration, I've gone with it. Right. Do you know what I mean? So, totally. and where and, and if they've shown aspiration that I'm not happy with, I just try and guide them away <laughs> from it. Um, yeah, we swerve away. Yeah, yeah. But that is how I've done it, and that is what I'm doing here. Yes. Rather than saying I've got a three-point program yeah. that will help you, it's more. Where were you at? So I would I would definitely say everything we do has to be undergirded by prayer. There's there isn't a capacity to be a person of faith where prayer isn't what you stand on as your foundation. But then standing on that foundation, mm. I then look to say, what can I do? And I say to everyone on, in the church, so last Sunday, we had a one-to-one -one conversation in the whole church mm. on youth and safety. The whole church took part in the conversation. There was no sermon. The young people went, secondary so, school there went. There was no sermon. There was no sermon. Yes. Yes. There was no sermon. Oh, so the young people went and they talked about what makes you feel safe? What makes you feel unsafe? What do you think one thing you could do to help um, others or yourself be safer? We got the, um, uh, the 
primary school students to do exactly the same thing because we know this challenge doesn't um, just um, manifest itself when young people are 15 and 16. We know that it's starting when they are in primary school and that they're being challenged or groomed from primary school to either carry things or do things. So we've got to be mindful and listen yeah. to young people. So that's the first thing. Give them an opportunity where they can speak without us directing what they've got to say. So that's what the one-to-ones were about. They were a listening opportunity. And then we asked the older people. So I took the two, two of the oldest people in church, you know, um, the ones who sit at the back with their jackets like this, don't listen to anything, you know, and want to comment about everything. And I just said to them, so, you know, what is it? You know, you live here, you've lived here for how many years? 50 years, some, I think. Um, what, do you feel safe? And they said, well, they feel safe, but not at night because they're age. Um, and they turned to prayer because they think there's nothing that they could do. So I said, do you talk to our young people in church? Mm. Do you actually know their names? Do you know what they're doing? Have you taken time out to just spend five minutes with them to show them that as a grandparent or a great grandparent, you want to have some yeah. form of relationship with yeah. them? You care about them. Have you done that? And the answer is no, because in so many churches, and I will speak for mine, I won't speak for everybody else's, people have their cliques. Yeah. They come in by their age cliques. Yeah. The pastor maybe knows everybody or most people, depending on the size of the church, yeah. but then people separate out in their groups, even in church. Might do some interactive activities, but generally we still <clears throat> move in our age ranges. So I just said to them, what you need to be doing in church as we go forward, and we're going to be doing it. We're going to be opening some tables yeah. after church, and we're just going to just spend some time, maybe every six, every once a term, just open a table and get people to sit down and eat together. Because yeah. food and fellowship <clears throat> always brings people together. I, I mean, I think there's so many important things you both just said there. I mean, one of the things which comes up again and again is the intergenerational connection. Absolutely or the intergenerational <coughs> disconnect, yeah. and therefore it's kind of how do you, like you just said, engage the older generation, the younger generation. Um, but also, obviously you guys are both passionate about young people, you know. Uh, I, I lead a church myself, but I also know the difficulties of somehow, sometimes trying to get your church to come along with you on the journey. Um, and obviously you've alluded to how you kind of bring those conversations into the mix, but would you give, is there any advice you can give specifically to, to church leaders who are thinking, yeah, this is a passion of mine, but I've got a church who, oh, I have a really disconnected with the issue. Um, how would you kind of steer people in a way where they're, they're, they're actually caring about this, this thing, this epidemic which is around us? Can, can I um, answer that, but also pick up Sure. around um, the, I suppose, intergenerational, mm. the family thing. So, so, so for me, um, family is key. Uh, and what I mean by that is God presents himself as father first, and he's a father who loves. And so um, everything that comes from God has that family relationship about it. And if we take that out of it, we miss something very fundamental about who God is and about how we're meant to relate. Um, in one, um, I think it's 1 Timothy 5, uh, at the beginning of 1 Timothy 5, it says, um, when Timothy's, Paul's given instructions to Timothy, he says, uh, treat older men as fathers, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with absolute purity. If we can learn in church to build family relationships, we actually help young people who may not have a strong family network or relationship to, to do family relationships. Because if you don't teach them how to relate, if you don't teach young men how to relate to young women in an appropriate way, they won't learn that simply by being around. They're not taught that elsewhere. But the church has a really good opportunity to teach people how to be family. And I don't mean 
you know, the nuclear family, me and my children. I mean the church as family. Rosemary is a mother in that sense. I'm a father in that sense. You're a father over the family of the church. You need to teach those relationships because that is how God does it. He teaches us how to relate through family. And so I think that, that, that churches can do that and that is totally in line with what they believe. It doesn't take any extra to go, oh, okay, we're just going to reorientate ourselves around so that we become a family. And family is not so much about the size of the church, but it is about the nature of the relationships in the church. And that's what you need to teach people. And that is what we are trying to teach people, uh, our young men. So they are relating to kids, two-year-olds and three-year-olds, to older, older people, to younger women. And they're learning to relate, firstly, because... I suppose there is this thing about relating to them in a particular way, mm. but also they're observing how other people are relating. Sure. Sure. And so the appropriateness of doing this or doing right. that, they're learning it simply by being around it. I just need to, I need to put on that, that sometimes you need to teach older people how to relate to young people. Because I, I really feel sometimes we put so much pressure on the young people. Yes. In church last mm. week, I had some young people saying, so why is it that when I, when I come in, the aunties won't speak to me? but I must speak to them wow. and I get told off if I don't speak to them. But then if they're not speaking to me, then what's that about? They, they can't really hear you. Yeah. So, so I, I, say to, I say to them, yeah. when I was brought up, I was always taught, if you come into a space, you, spe you speak into the space. So you say hello. I walk in a door, I see you, I say hello, Ben. I don't wait for you to see me because you're already in the space mm. and I've entered the space. That's the way so I've So it's something about it. breaking some it's traditions. A, it's about, it's just about just <clears throat> enabling yeah. relationship and communication. Wow. The whole world <clears throat> stops when we stop communicating. Yeah. And what we've got with some of these young people is a breakdown in communication. Sure. So I think that we've got to learn better ways to communicate. But we've got to put our shoulders down, some of us older folk, and let young people yes. just be the leaders and listen to them and learn from them. Yes. Because as they grow, they need to be able to be shown that we trust them. Mm. And in the same way that Jesus places his trust in young people. And he tells us from the Bible, how do we do it? Mm. What does Jesus say in the Bible? He places a young person, a poor young person in the midst and tells but us we've... that we have to care such as these. But we've got to also be, <clears throat> you know, I can imagine some people saying that's all well and good, but you know, it's what I'm seeing on, in the media, what I'm seeing in the, in the press, I'm seeing, you know, a lot of these young guys have stereotypically got their pants down and balaclavas and listen to music yeah. which are uh, inappropriate or actually lead to serious violence yeah. or, or even death. Um, it's easy for us to say, yeah, we must engage and connect, but Fear. There is, I know, Absolutely. talking to some older people, it's like this generation is, you know, even if it's just a simple case of I'm not watching what's on the news, I know some older people have said to me, I've just seen how these young people <coughs> act on a bus. Mm -hmm. And I'm honest, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm scared. Yeah, I, so, so I don't think the answer is for me, or maybe you, I don't know, maybe you, but it, the answer isn't for me to be approaching young people on the bus and saying, hey guys, how are you... That's not the answer, right. yeah? The answer is to recognise that inside our churches sure. are young people that know these young people, are friends with these young people and are engaging with these young people. Mm. And if I can build this right, and this is exactly what I'm doing, because I have in my church young people who in the last three months their friends have been murdered on the streets. Yeah, they're actual mates. Yeah, not just, no. oh, a guy I knew. No, this is his, one of his best mates growing up. Yeah. yeah. So if I can create this family relationship where, where, where appropriate relationships, if I can build into them grace and mm. kindness and the gospel, um, they are in the better position to reach. Yeah, with the support of the church, they're in a better position to reach. Me going, all the fear and all the other things come into play sure. that make that a really difficult thing. Um, whereas I think if you build something with the... Now, not every church has those young people directly in them, but, but young people always connected to young people who are connected to young sure. people. Do you know what I mean? It yes. doesn't take a lot for you to reach this person. Yes. Um, and so... I think that you, you, you need to build the right way 
inside your church. Because one of our challenges, yeah. Ben, is that, and you know that, that, that churches aren't always doing that. So, so yes. a lot of those young people in the churches are engaged in some of the... Well, this is a, I'm glad you mentioned this, because this is a point. Having some, I've worked in this field, as you, if you've known, for over 16, 17 years. Um, and I can honestly say that maybe 90% of the young people who have either been victims or perpetrators or I've worked with, when you start talking to them, talk, looking at their history, have come from the church. So it's, some people may be listening or watching this thinking, well, it's all well and good. We, we're advocating for the church to be the answer. A lot of people might be thinking, well, maybe church is part of the problem. And I'll just be really interested just to hear your views on, on, on that. I would say that you're absolutely right. And I just want to say what Owen is saying. All you can do is what you can do with the, with the people that God has sent you to work with. And you can do your very best. Now, one of our young people, as an example, we've, when we had the knife bin, he picked up a knife where he was, and there was no bin between where he was and where we are, and he put it in his jacket. He got stopped. He said to the police, when they asked him, he said, I've got a knife, I've just picked it up on the common, I'm taking it to my church. Of course, they didn't believe him. Anyway, roll it forward. Obviously, he ended up in court. We were right behind him, and thanks be to God, he just graduated. No record. We have sustained and supported that young man to, and ensured that he did not fall foul. And the reason he did that was because he saw it and to stop another person from being harmed, he picked it up to bring it to the knife bin. Yes. So that's one that I can definitely say we have worked with. And that's all you can do. Me, I go, that's what I can do. Yes. It's exactly as Owen says, you are trying your very best. We fail, we fall down. There's no way that we don't stumble, mm. but we try our very best to work with our young people. However, I want to also add that church is not an island. We don't operate just in a silo. Parish churches, like the Church of England churches, work in community. Right. Many times we are blessed, we have church schools. So our capacity to work and engage is not just the maybe 20 or 30 young people that may be in your church or more if you're bigger, but also for me, I have 220 young people mm. in my church school that I have the capacity to go and spend time with, to talk to, <coughs> and to engage them around issues of safety, but also issues of love and yeah. grace and mercy. Yeah. And that's what I said about starting early. Sure. So yes, I get it. I, one of, I confirmed a young man when he was 13 years of age mm. and buried him when he was 15. So. I know exactly what it means to see a young person move away, join the gang, get caught up, and end up then losing his life in a stairwell in Wandsworth. So yes, definitely yeah. not saying church is the only solution. Mm. Church has to be part of mm. the fabric that is woven for the lives of these young people. Yes. So whether that's school, whether it's supporting their families. I think we mentioned earlier the importance of family. Yeah. Um, these young people may come to church, but they will come from fragmented families and communities. Sure. Many of them, if they're around mm. by me, yes, we've got nuclear families, if you want to call that a mm. family structure, but they've also, some of them, have got extended families. Yeah. And it needs that combination of working with the parents, with the school, and with any other community group that you may find mm. around you, collaborating to see what you can do to build that support for the young people. And I, and I think what you've just said there is, is fascinating because I'm not sure how many churches, whether it's a permission thing or an arrogance, feel like they can collaborate with different sectors of the community. Mm. You know, again, the government and various other people are talking about public health and listed models where we do have this almost cross-fertilisation yeah. of, of connections. But even having two church leaders from different denominations in a room sometimes is hard enough to kind of get together. So I think there is something about being import important coming together. I think the other thing what you've just said there is some practical things where you can help. So you uh, went along to the court case of a, a young person in my own church. We have unfortunately helped pay for funerals um, and we have also funded 
organisations to go into schools to do some early intervention work. Uh, we've encouraged our, our congregation to be involved in independent advisory groups and safer neighbourhood uh, boards just to be able to get in the, in the mix. So I think this stuff is important, but I'm not sure this comes naturally no. to, to church leaders or church members. I mean, I, I, I do agree with what you said, and I, and I think as a local church, we have done, so even last Sunday, now obviously we maybe take a different kind of tact, having had people who have suffered loss in the way that they have, and, and we also had a loss in our church, we had a service where, in essentially, we, we, we taught people or spoke into, how do Christians grieve according to their faith? How do you do that? Because you do that very differently to how the world grieves. Do you know how to do it? So, uh, and, and I do think that we do a number of things. We're running at, like Beacon internships at the moment with some of these um, guys that are, are on it. However, I think that some of our churches need to ask questions about what they are doing. Right. Because I do think, <clears throat> I, I do think that some churches where, where young people are coming out and getting involved, they have to just ask questions. Are, what are we doing to actually help our young people um, not get engaged in those kinds of things? So I do, I do think. So in a church like ours, kids work, youth work, big thing. Yeah, so we would, if we, if we had the money, we'd employ youth workers, even if we had 20 young people, yeah? Um, and it's not just about singing songs on a Sunday, yeah? There is much, much more to life than that. And I think in, I think in some churches, we're, we've not got beyond that kind of thing, and we don't recognise, if you've got 100 young people, my goodness, get a pastor. If you had 100 people, you'd, find, you'd pay for a pastor. If you've got 100 young people, pay for a pastor to look after those young people, because if you don't do that, some of those on the edge or some of those who are vulnerable will end up doing things and, and it, you'll just think, oh yeah, well they're kind of backslidden. But I'm like, no, you actually have an opportunity to yeah. work with them and bring them in. The priority of it is part of the issue yeah. that in churches, young people in that sense are not made a priority sure. in a way that they could and should be. And I don't simply mean youth services. That, no. doesn't, that doesn't always answer the problem. Yeah. But, but having pastors who are trained and equipped and supported mm. to work with young people will really help. Yeah. All these other things will help, but, but churches can do that. And some churches can do that, and maybe they're not doing that. Um, our time is coming to uh, an end. Uh, so I just want to give you an opportunity if there's any kind of final thoughts. I mean, uh, I probably know the answer to this question anyway, but are you both hopeful for the future around this issue? Do you see uh, a light at the end of the tunnel? Um, do you see actually churches beginning to be galvanised into action in a way maybe you haven't seen in, in the past? I'm just wondering, what do you see the future for this particular issue and specifically with church engagement? Just going to get a little plug. Um, in just over a month, I'm helping to organise and coordinate a huge M25 um, in an N25 event at Southwark Cathedral, bringing together um, mainly Christians, <coughs> focusing on the Anglican Church because in that area we've got over 500 um, churches, so uh, bringing together that group. But we're also looking at Bexley and Bromley, which is um, from what we would call the Diocese of Rochester. We're looking in Barking because we know that this problem is for us in London, it's a whole London-wide problem. Mm. But we're not just bringing together the Anglican Church because we don't have the answer. So we're bringing in together the City Hall mm. um, we're, and their MOPAC team. We're, ben, you're going to be there because we want to, our ecumenical colleagues to be there also. We're bringing MPs, mm. we're bringing local councillors, yeah. and we're bringing people to the table yeah. to talk about this issue. Not just the talk because Ben's met me before and he knows. Walking and talking, I don't want you to just walk and pray. I don't want you to just talk and pray. I want you to walk and talk and act because young people's lives are being lost yeah. and not just lost in terms of deaths, mm. but lost in terms of lack of access to education, lack of capacity to be the person God wants them to be <coughs> because they're just not getting opportunities. So we've got to look at the real nub of the problem. Yeah. And this event 
is trying to get us to start on that and then pull some resources together. I know you're building some, mm. other people will have some. Let's bring those resources together, let's collaborate and let's see what we can all do to really let people know this is an important issue, it's not going to go away, it needs all of our work and it's a long-term project. Yeah. How can we deal with this? And let's put it right at the yeah. centre of our agendas, as Armin has just said, yeah. front and centre of our agendas, because I know it's a hackneyed phrase, young people completely are the future. We're all going to go and pass away. We've got to give them the best foundation. Yeah. As a Christian, I know that that's Jesus Christ, mm. and I know that it's our prayers and our love and our mercy will be part of the solution, but it's got to be from secular organisations as well and from young people themselves yeah. all coming together and saying, how can we move forward on this? So I'm really hopeful. Yeah. I wouldn't be a follower of Jesus if I wasn't hopeful, Absolutely. but I do think that practical action yeah. and pragmatic action has got to be part of the way forward. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm probably less pragmatic in my <laughs> approach. Uh, I, I think that uh, I'm hopeful because I'm, I, I'm hopeful or but have real faith that God is committed to his own promises and that God is going to work out his purposes and his purposes are not to see a whole generation be lost. Yeah, And so that the, the hope of the gospel is that, is that young people can um, find... Uh, hope and faith and life in Jesus. That's, that's the hope of the gospel. I'm also hopeful, um, uh, not meaning to do a plug, but um, you know we're involved in this event called New Day, uh, which is a Christian festival. Uh, what I have seen at New Day and, and in my church is I have seen young people's lives transformed. I've literally seen them changed. Mm. And, and that their testimony, even those who have been to church, their testimony was, oh, it was only when I went to New Day that I realised I wasn't a Christian and that I then found Jesus. And, and that has completely changed their lives. Mm. And, so, and so working with uh, an event like New Day, which gathers five, 6,000 young people every year and now doing more and more things through the year and supporting that, taking young people to that. We've done that even as churches together in Brixton. Mm. We've taken young people over the years to New Day so that for me is a really big thing. That the, the gospel is is a really is a really big part of it. And and if churches can connect to God builds family. Right. And so the church should become family. And family is about the relationships. Um, and if we can build those things, I think we can gather more and more young people into church. And I think we will draw other young people yeah. uh, from that. I'm hopeful also because my now engagement with young people tells me they want help. Yes. They want help. Yeah. That, and if you approach it right, they are, they are very open and responsive yeah. to help. Young people that you might not imagine are like that, are actually like that. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for your time. I've got huge respect for both of you. I think um, I, I've known Owen for years and I've seen how you've evolved in this and it's brilliant. I'm getting to know you, I love your passion. I, I love the directness and how pragmatic you are. Um, this is the whole thing about Power to Fight. We are trying to bring different people together to try and impact communities uh, to reduce youth violence. So this is brilliant. So thank you very much for your time. Okay, pleasure. Uh, yeah, God bless you.